Thank you so much. I feel honored and privileged to present uh, this afternoon. I battled with flu in case I'm not very clear. Uh, uh, I apologize. <laughs> My talk is um, moving out of language boxes uh, and I'm going to argue for a pedagogy of integration. This is the outline for my talk. And I want to start with uh, a quote, a linguist friend, Elena Shahami. She says, language is like life. There's an aspiration for order, for control, for possession, driven by fear of the unknown, of the powers and sources of evil. But there's always the reality that language, like life, cannot be controlled. All other kinds of control uh, mechanisms, uh, they do not work. Okay. <coughs> oops, oops. <laughs> so whatever that you do with language, trying to control it, it doesn't really work because language is like life. Uh, let me start by putting up front that uh, multilingualism is often misconstrued as multiple uh, unilingualisms okay? with separated boundaries. These are hermetically, um, uh, hermetically sealed units. Okay? And this idea is, is origins from the Eurocentric invent and concept of language of the 1920s. For example, the work of von Humboldt, of one nation, one language. And then, of course, that cascade into one classroom one language under the pretext of nation building. Um, of course, you also use language to exclude uh, other people at the same time. Then you had, over, throughout history, teachers becoming enslaved uh, as boundary gutters against cross-contamination of one language by the other. Okay? We know from the history of South African languages that they became casualties of what you call linguistic tribes. Uh, through the Bantus and homeland system. Of course, as a sequel to the Afro-Balkanization of 1884, right? learning from that. But in the 21st century, we know that uh, human identities are far much more complex than our narrow thinking about uh, language. In this presentation, I'm going to make two uh, very important claims. One, languages are embedded into one another. Uh, here I'm going to move uh, with what you call the social linguistics of mobility that is not tied to space and time. It is language in motion, okay, as opposed to the variation is of space and a particular time. Okay? And language teachers need to build on this plural and mobile communicative repertoires that students bring with them into the classroom. Um, Act 108 of 1996, of course, enshrined 11 official languages, uh, but we know that in practice we have gravitated towards uh, unilingualism. Okay. And of course, there were linguists who casted a shadow of doubt on, on those cons uh, artificial constructions within our constitution, or what Magoni calls misinventions, which of course will result in um, monolingual uh, perpetuation of monolingual practices. Okay? What we see, therefore, is we have inherited uh, monolithic practices. We maintain language immersion uh, policies where children are immersed or assimilated into a unicultural orientation instead of the other way around. Children having to be socialized towards being multiple, not towards becoming uh, unilingual. Okay? And of course, as we do that, because that's not the way in which they access information naturally, our schools are failing the children. You'll see with the dismal literacy rates, there are lots of problems with, of course, schooling, but I want to move that language and literacy is quite a big uh, part of the story. Uh, if you think about this, you'll notice that um, this is what I call stupefaction of the children because when they come in at grade one they are still relatively better off and then as they go down especially notice um, 
between grade four and five, four and three and four. That's why you have got this lump. And then out of that, they never recover. They're doomed because this is the stage where uh, habits need to be formed. They need to move more into concrete, you know, abstract uh, levels of thinking. Okay? And of course, the high school to university, the picture is so bleak. It's going very, very uh, in an anticipated ways. And of course, our throughput at universities is dismally, dismally low. Okay? Um, now, it is for this reason that I want to uh, uh, talk about translanguaging framework where we need to move away from fixity to fluidity. Okay? Uh, within translanguaging framework, we think that languages should not be viewed as uh, separated uh, systems that need to be placed in some kind of boxing or boxes, rather. And it accounts for heteroglossic situations where you can have <coughs> one input in one language and then you have an output in a different language. Okay? Or other modes, if not language, could be visual and other ways. Um, therefore, we are very critical to notions such as first language, second language, additive, or diglossia, even for that matter, because all what they suggest is a sequential, linear way in which languages are acquired or used. Okay? Um, and of course, they tend to favor monoglossic uh, class, uh, curriculum. Um, what we, the mode of operation here, you see, speakers who grow up multilingually, they soft assemble. They have got a range of systems in their head, an expanded code from which they choose and pick at any point, uh, depending on the social context as it demands. Okay? Uh, slightly different from code switching, because code switching um, is really language-centered and not necessarily speaker-centered. In this model, we talk about centering whole communication from the point of view of the speaker. Okay. Uh, the story of indigenous African languages, and of course, uh, learning English as a second language. Uh, they have got a challenge, which is to broaden their standard varieties to include uh, forms that are not traditionally associated with them. They have been fixed and therefore they are unable to move with times. Again, uh, when it comes to English language classroom as well, you, have, you see this kind of boxing. The langu these languages are not <laughs> given space uh, to infiltrate and to get in because of the nature of their multilingual orientation. Okay? Our methodologies are very, very dated. Uh, they're very less communicative and generally very monoglossic versus what you call the locus of plurality. That's what they bring in into the classroom as a resource, the collective. Uh, therefore, you, there's no surprise in that you have this yawning disjuncture between permeable use in fluid multilingual settings versus the rigid classroom spaces. Right? And uh, of course, it's very difficult to develop any pedagogical framework to for teaching African languages, for example, as to speakers of other languages, as you have with English, for example, teaching English to speakers of other languages. Now, my question is, could translanguaging be an alternative uh, for us in South Africa and <coughs> elsewhere in multilingual context to develop biliteracy and multilingualism as a norm? I'm going to share with you one quick experiment in a Sibedi new language uh, at the Vest School of Education, these are referred to as new language, newness in terms of literacy, and uh, not necessarily that they are truly new, but they have not been exposed to reading and writing in that language. In fact, uh, this is true for many, many South Africans, even though we have 11 official languages, nine indigenous African languages, we really have literacy in one of the languages because the school situation has only allowed you to learn and read only in your mother tongue and not in another language. Um, so here we wanted to ensure that before the teachers get out of the, uh, at our system, they are ready for multilingual classrooms. They had to learn a language outside of their comfort zones. For example, if you are in the Nguni cluster, you cannot take another language in Nguni and vice versa because we believe they are really mutually intelligible. Okay. 
Um, so this is a, a spare class, but then she saw uh, is Zulu is closer, sort and develop were allowed in the classroom without any problems. Uh, it became the course is more communicative, it uses functional notional syllabus where they have to do certain basic things with language like uh, giving directions, for example. Uh, the instructor's role explicitly calls for uh, other languages to be used to explain certain concepts, for example, on the distinction between plurality versus when you show respect. How do you do that in your home language? Are they different? Are they similar? And then we do what is called contrastive elaboration, and they can move with that. Okay? And of course, the, they have got multilingual blocks where they use Spedi and any other language in that block to talk, to reflect on their classrooms. Okay? Um, qualitative and quantitative <coughs> means of, of going through the study were followed. I won't go into that. Um, but these are some of the uh, meta language in reflections. Okay? I realized that learning that the language reminds me of similar culture I have in my language. I can identify with my baby people better now. Okay? Identification with the target culture. Okay? <coughs> Um, that was not the intended consequence of the course, of course, but that's what you see. Now here you see that they, as they, the course has affirmed what you call the collective or Ubuntu worldview, okay? because they saw exactly the same kind of thinking uh, in the target language. Um, now here they even have, they have got ideas of wanting to continue further self-efficacy okay? and the stigmas that are attached to not learning or using an African language in this case didn't really play out. Okay? Highly motivated. Um, okay, I went back. Mutual intelligibility. Now, the interesting thing here is as they learned Sepedi in class, when they went outside, they realized that, by the way, speakers of Seswana and Sesotho, they could use the knowledge that they gained from class to expand their linguistic horizon to talk, and they realized that, but I thought these languages were different, but I'm just talking like I'm okay, I'm accepted by these other speakers. In fact, Neville Alexander and Jacob Nshabo uh, educated South Africans about harmonization of mutually intelligible languages. In fact, what you see here is some kind of experiential uh, harmonization where they actually feel it and use it, not just linguistic harmonization. Can we confirm this uh, through numbers? Of course, yes, our experimental group generally outperformed uh, your control group statistically significant ways okay, when it comes to vocabulary uh, development. Okay? And then oral reading proficiency, there isn't so much of a real big difference here, but of course the experimental group is still relatively a uh, little bit higher. Okay? Um, of course, there's an explanation for this because they were not allowed or they were not reading in these other languages, but only in one language. So what this is telling us, when they use one language, um, uh, that's what you have. Uh, but overall, there has been a very, very significant um, uh, statistical significant gains uh, in the experimental group on all uh, the variables that were tested. Okay? Let me rush to the next experiment, which is experiment two, reading uh, literacy in English and speed in a primary school. The purpose of this project was to look at cognitive, contextual, and motivational conditions in which uh, high-performing kids uh, do. Uh, and the key here is outside of the phonological, graphological processing of high-frequent words, home and classroom literacy events were embedded, they were part of the course in both of the intervention rather, in both languages. Um, so we are borrowing this from a biliteracy model, the linguistic interdependence hypothesis that uh, bidirectional transfer of first language and second language reading skills, they can go either way, uh, depends. Of course, Nancy Hornberger's biliteracy continua, which is an ecological point of view, that breaks the boundary between reading and writing and first language and second language and other modes of communication. They continue uh, side by side, they grow together. There's that uh, possibility. 
the Matthew effect uh, in reading trajectories, the poor shall be poor and the richer shall be richer. Those who have got poor reading skills in the beginning are likely to end that way as poor. And those who have got better reading skills. This also applies to two languages if they have got better reading skills in, a, in English uh, they are likely to end up with better reading skills in English and not in home language. How do we offset this Matthew, if, uh, Matthew effect in terms of reading trajectory? Because we want to go for biliterate uh, model and not uniliterate one. Um, okay, translanguaging approach was imposed into the classroom. Again, phonological awareness, we are doing reading and writing. I think the next, this one is more interesting for me. Uh, where kids read in one language and they write uh, in a different language and vice versa. So you have an input in one language and then you have an output in a different language. Uh, this is what you have. So we had to create multilingual print. You populate uh, the classroom with first language and second language uh, text. And the children begin to own, they use their own little pieces of writing, they can write love, they can use crayon, they can do anything, but the big story here is they are doing this one language and in the next language. You don't leave one language behind. Okay? And uh, here, for example, when you listen to Sabahaha, which is a title, and they have to retell the story. You own the story and you tell it in your own ways. What was significant here, then they will change even the titles. What it means for them, it was Komaya Vakhah. It was all about the cultural uh, orientation of the Vakhaha people in Limpopo. But they thought Koma circumcision was the most dominant thing that they took out of the story. Okay? Because that is probably what they can, in the, ta in, the, in the moment, relate to. You have got text in English, and they have to write this back also in their home language. Um, in the end, this is what you have, a very mixed, rich print environment at the literacy corners in both languages. Um, home, great, great, great effect. Now, the children got really highly motivated that they began to demand reading in any language, in English and in, uh, in Sepedi, in this particular case. Um, this is, grandmother has to listen every night now because the kids are fully charged. Uh, they want more books, they want to read, and they want to read for, one of the simple things that was done was you read 15 minutes uh, before you sleep and read it to your mom, read it to your dad, or read it to anybody else in, anybody else in the house, or let them read for you if they can. Um, and then here is a kid who really demanded that the old woman had to go get some <coughs> her pension money in order to buy books. Uh, what does this tell us to little rich, uh, the textbook that they have were almost exhausted. They read everything and they wanted more text outside of school. And this is a book outside of school that the poor grandma had to go find. Um, this little boy has got a very interesting story because what he does He's an orphan, his mom died. I think he realized that when sick people are very sick, they tend to become lonely. So he picks up any book and he goes to any friend, anybody he knows is sick, and he just reads the book. Why are you doing this? Because I think they're lonely. Now, is the literacy beginning to uh, be used really to do something in the society? I think this is one of the classical cases. Can we support this by numbers? Of course, very much so. Um, you, have, you see in the pre-test, the post-test results are remarkably significantly statistically significant. Of course, there was much more improvement in English than in their home language. Okay? And this, I think, is a great lesson for English teachers as well, that in fact, when you think you are doing African languages, you might uh, incidentally be improving uh, literacy rates in English as well, so it's not just a one language. Overall effect, that's fine, statistically significant, there's no problem with that, and I want to say that there are few, these few things before I step out. Um, both experiments question the validity of language boxing and monoglossic pedagogy in multilingual settings. Uh, multilingual learners, we have learned, they shuttle between uh, languages in non-conflictual but complementary ways. And this is what we mean by the trans language. And multilingualism is not monolingualism times two 
or terms 11. Okay? Languages and literacies are permeable and they need to be socially embedded, what you call indexicality. Uh, multiple identities reflected an expanded sense of self, okay? the Ubuntu locus of being, right? uh, especially in the first experiment. Uh, development of literacy requires a threshold in both languages, so you don't teach one language by that language when somebody is very multilingual, a resource that comes in there. Uh, social outcome, uh, income, significant gains in language literacy can be attributed to trans languages, I would claim. There were positive association with other languages and permeable uh, cross-cultural ethos that are beyond discrete uh, language units. Uh, I already spoke about experiential mutual intelligibility um, versus linguistic mutual intelligibility or harmonization in the social intercomprehensibility. Balanced by liter literacy trajectories depend on if on us if we valorize uh, discursive those social incomes okay, as as children what they have already instead of trying to invent or reduce. In conclusion, towards a plural vision, uh, language is like life. Attempts to police it are simply futile. Monolithic strategies are not consonant with the realities of the 21st century. Uh, we need to be moving into social linguistics of mo uh, mobility that is spatial temporally complex. Teachers are called upon to allow multilingual <coughs> spaces and antecedent genres and discursive resources learners bring with them to class. These social incomes ensure meaningful education and affirm identities of multilingual learners. Teachable translanguage strategies should be infused, in my view, in all multilingual or multicultural classrooms. This way we will diffuse the negative stereotypes that uh, were traditional associated to African languages and multilingualism as the tower of the Babel. Instead, we can recognize that multilingualism is a resource, in fact, a power of uh, the Babel. More successful stories, of course, are needed uh, so that we can clearly move into this pedagogy of integration. This is the power of the Babel. Thank you so much.